Good. <laughs> Been a good day thus far. No kidding. <laughs> All right, let's see. Announcements. Uh, the test results are not back yet. I guess they had nothing to do the first time and had them back lickety split, but they're not back yet, so sorry. I'll post them as soon as I get them. Uh, anything that's just you can't wait, you got, you, you're losing sleep over? Because as soon as I, I, I expect them, I hope this afternoon, and I'm going to post the uh, solutions to it um, this afternoon so you can see all the, the answers and my explanations. Somebody, I think it was from our class, left a calculator. I think they were sitting over here. There you go. And um, which one's Mar Mariah? Is Mariah here? Maria? I don't know. Green. No, she's not here. Okay. That's something to tell her. <laughs> And again, there was a student uh, many lectures ago now that asked me for recommendations on books for Newton. I asked him to email me so I could send him the links. Is he here? And he never emailed me, so I haven't sent him to But I was wondering if you're still curious, because I have them. <laughs> you can take this, but, or they, if you send me an email, then you have the link you can just click. But I thought of a few. And. Has anybody seen the uh, little mid-semester evaluation survey email? Okay, good. It did come out. Didn't like how they set it up because I, I, I said, yeah, let, let it happen. And they just said, okay, well, what's it look like? What questions do they ask? How are the students going to know? They didn't tell me anything. <laughs> of course, this week I got an email too. There is online, it should have been sent to your, uh, your email, your university email. Um, just a little mid-term evaluation I chose to do so that I can get some feedback. And so if there's something that I'm doing well, I can continue doing. Or if uh, something that annoys you, <laughs> I can stop. Um, it's totally anonymous, so I won't know who did it. It doesn't count in your grade or anything. Um, and you have, uh, I think, the rest of this week and weekend to do it. I can't remember when it ends, but I'll remind you now and Friday. I, I strongly encourage you to do that so that I can, I can better structure this class and make it a better learning experience for you and, and in the future. And I, I really do. I'll read every one of those. So please fill them out. That'd be great. What did you say at once? Uh, the university said they were going to send it to, to every student in my class through email, that there'd be a link. Uh, raise your hand again if you noticed it already. So actually, over half have. So check your email, I guess. If it's you, you, it probably comes to your university email when you sit up there. Because they, they just go, well, probably, oh, here's a UID number. It's probably that, you know, at Utah. Yeah, but yeah, we have this, they, they're, just, they're just having it open for about a week. I think it started Monday. I didn't want to bore you with that during the test, so. <laughs> Groovy. All right, we're, uh, like I said, test day, going to start the next unit on heat. It's chapters uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So just four chapters before the next test. Uh, 15, I start today, it's on heat, temperature, and thermal expansion. And uh, the next one is heat transfer, how we can uh, move the energy from one place to another in the different methods. And then it's probably getting them out of order. Phase changes and thermodynamics. So I, I chose this because uh, two reasons. I think too many people in this world do not understand heat well enough. But you use it all the time. It's one of those ubiquitous things whether you realize it or not. That's what physics is about to help you understand the world. So I'm covering it so that you'll be smarter than the average uh, layperson. Second, I think the first uh, heat-related class I ever took 
was not in my physics class because it was at the very end of the normal first semester stuff and usually people don't get to it and then they blow it off for the second semester. I uh, was in engineering class and I can still honestly say it was the worst class I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> you know, I hated it. I hated the way it was set up and so of course I have a bad taste in my mouth for thermodynamics and it's still lingering. But the more I study it, the more I, I like it. I understand it. I just I realized I hated that instructor. But uh, I mean, disliked. I had a bad attitude, whatever. Uh, it's pretty cool, though. I like it. <laughs> and a lot of the stuff is good. Uh, we're not going to make you look up into charts and things. I hope by the time we're done with this, you'll appreciate it. And it, it ties right into forces, energy, and fluids. So this shouldn't be a weird, crazy stretch for us, because we're prepared for it. So let's see, it should be about two lectures each chapter. So like 15 I'll start today and finish Friday, and then 16, 2, 17, 2, 18, 2, re-review and have a test. Uh, that's if everything works out well. Yeah. Uh, and last announcement, I knew there was another one. Again, superhero assignment. This time, it's not so much a reminder to uh, think about getting it done to save yourself headache. It's more, I assume you've already started thinking about it. Please read my instruction sheet. That's how what I'm grading you on. Everything's there I, that I am concerned about. Um, a lot of people fail to ref refer back to that and just start going and writing. And it might be a nice paper, but it didn't meet any of my criteria. So just refer back to that to make sure you know what I'm expecting so that I don't have to dock you for non-physics stuff. Yeah? Does it have to be a hero? You know, I'm fine. It can be a villain if, if he has superpowers. And again, it can be in accordance with the laws of physics or violating as long as you justify it as explained in the instructions. Yeah, villain's fine. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading these. Okay. Any questions about anything? All righty. Temperature. That's what we're going to start with. Yeah, I guess that's up there for you to see. That was more, uh, can you compare my notes with his notes? What the heck is temperature? Light prevents us from temperature is light that prevents us from reading? Oh, yeah, I, I actually don't want you to see that. That's why. I wanted you to see the first one. I didn't want you to see that one. I'm going to tell you what temperature is right now. If you had to explain it to your mother, you go, and we use temperature all the time, but if you have to define it, what do you say it is? Is that what you would have said before this class? Because you've had the average amount of heat in it. Okay, that, that's that's very close. Not quite right, but yes. How hot or cold something is, and that's how we use it. It's a measure so we can know how hot or cold it is. Temperature gets that, what is it actually measuring? What is, if something's hot or cold, what does that tell us? Or whatever you were gonna say. <laughs> um, amount of energy it takes to raise mercury so much. The amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of something so much. That's in this chapter. That's specific heat of capacities, but it's not temperature. Because you just, it's, to raise its temperature, so you can't cyclically define it. It is um, some key points here. That's a measure. That's why, because we use it as a tool to measure all kinds of things. Of, I want to write it right, average, important. Translational, I'll, def I'll explain it, important. Kinetic energy. per molecule of the substance. My main point of this chapter 
Hopefully when you're done, if you don't know anything else, and even if you flunk the test, I want you to know that there's a difference between, I want you to know what temperature is, and I want you to know what heat is. They're different things, and how they relate to your life. So that's my bare minimum goal. Temperature, a measure of average translational kinetic energy per molecule of substance. You remember what kinetic energy is? It's the energy associated with? Motion, right. And translational is what we've been dealing with up till now. Things moving in straight lines, back and forth. They're, they're displaced. They move. But things can move other ways. They can spin. They can uh, rotate. You know, you've got water molecules bonded to each other. They can kind of oscillate between each other. They can spin around like dumbbells. There's, so there's rotational kinetic energy and there's vibrational kinetic energy. Temperature measures, though, the translational kinetic energy, meaning going back and, f back and forth. It's moving. F it's displacing a distance. Because if we just say move, things can move in different ways. It's what we've been doing up till now. Thus, something can, uh, energy can go into a substance and make it start vibrating more, you know, uh, or oscillating. That doesn't increase its temperature. Only if the, part, the molecules of that substance are being displaced. They can move back and forth, sure. And it's uh, the per molecule of substance. It's on average. Uh, individual ones can be moving faster and slower. But on average, that's what we call the temperature. And in my uh, fun demos with the other three classes, I forgot one. <laughs> This is the, a model of what we just talked about. We'll use this a couple times through this chapter. Oh, let's put it at about... That works. So, what we have here is a fancy speaker, I'm driving it with a function generator. I'm going to make it oscillate. It's like I'm going to apply heat, like I put it on the stove. And what it's going to show us is the average translational kinetic energy of the molecules of the substance. Here's the substance, and like you can see the individual molecules. Work with me. <laughs> and, and we're going to see what happens. This is some, hardly anything is ever like this. Almost everything is moving. So if I... Uh, Turn up the heat a little bit. I'm putting energy in, thermal energy. Tra heat is the transfer of energy. Heat is the transfer of energy. Heat is the transfer of energy. So energy is being transferred into the little molecules. They're like balls. They feel a force. They have mass. They accelerate. Changes their motion. They speed up and slow down. Then they run into each other. There's collisions. Transfer of momentum. Kinetic energy. Usually gases are, it's elastic collision. So we have conservation of energy and uh, momentum. And so they can impart that to another particle, and it can pick up speed. If particles are coming together, whoosh, do you think they slow down or speed up afterwards? And they, they add, very good, it depends. It's a trick question. They bounce off. Let's make it easier. What if uh, two are moving along? And let's say this one's moving faster than this one. So it overtakes it. And then they collide and bounce off. What happens to this guy? Yeah, he slows down. But then this one speeds up. But the total energy was conserved. And so that's why one, it, that can happen in, in gases and particles, liquids, solids. And if they have more average translational kinetic energy, what just happened to the temperature? It increases. The temperature is a measure of the average translational kinetic energy of those. You can see that sometimes one, one individual one looks really blurry. It's going faster. It has more translational kinetic energy at that instant. But another one is in focus because it's not moving very fast at that given time. Whee! More obvious there. So, again, 
if this is a stove, we're transferring energy, thermal energy, heat, into these particles. The particles here in the stove are moving. They're at a high temperature. And they run into these guys. And then everything we just said, it, they run into each other. And eventually, on average, they're all going to uh, average translational kinetic energy. Yeah. And, and no, it's, it's not uh, transfiguring or transforming or transferring. Translate is, uh, it means more like, it, I don't know the linguistic roots, but it, it's straight, kind of linear. It's everything we've done up until now. I'm applying a force on, my, on the floor to translate myself across the floor, to move, to displace myself. So basically by translational, I mean everything we've done up till now. Not necessarily, I can apply energy to myself and make me spin. I'm moving. That's not what we're talking about. I can vibrate. That's not what we're talking about. A barbell, they can orbit around each other. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about displacing it, translating it a distance, displacing it. Well, see, no, because I'm moving. That's why I'm just differentiating. Because yeah, I, I don't want to just say, they're moving faster. Because how are they moving? Are they going like this? Are they going like this? Are they going like this? That's all motion and it's all energy. But temperature is only a measure of this translational kinetic energy. That's the point I'm trying to emphasize. Uh, as a better example, it's a couple chapters later. See, this sets it up for it, but let's give it to you now. When you change phases, you guys are all familiar, you melt ice. You take a block of ice, you stick it on the hot plate, and it needs to melt. The temperature of the ice doesn't change for a while. It's still about zero degrees Celsius. Once it melts, now the water can start to rise, raise its temperature. But we're putting heat, we're transferring heat into the ice. What's it, going, what's it doing? It's not, initially, increasing the temperature and thus increasing the average translational kinetic energy of the molecules, it's going into breaking the molecules apart, melting, into changing into water. That takes energy to go from ice to water. Now, we can, now that it's water, we can work on translating them and increasing the temperature, a phase change. When you put heat into, same with a liquid then, you go to boil water, you get water up to 100 degrees Celsius, that's where it boils. It turns into steam. That steam's still at 100 degrees initially, but it took energy to get from water to steam. That energy is going into doing other things, not translational. Does that help? Yeah, is that why boiling water is all kind of bouncy? Ultimately, yeah. Yeah, it's all that motion going on. And it heats up the air in there too, and b air bubbles come in, and they cause forces as well. That's usually what you see in the air bubble rise, because the air is less dense, so it has a buoy greater buoyant force than its weight, rises up, expands when it does it, because there's less pressure as it gets less, de less deep expands, and then it gets to the top and ruptures, and that causes waves too. But yeah. The more you add heat, the temperature can raise, and they start jostling around faster and faster, on average. So, like when something is burned under fire, is all that's really happening is the molecules are moving so much then that they just break apart from each other? If you heat things up too much, like in fire, yeah, everything has, like water. Let's take that one, uh, lit water molecules. They're kind of loosely bound to each other. I, maybe ice makes more sense because they're rigidly bound. If you apply enough heat, then eventually, yeah, they, it overcomes their binding energy and they break apart and become individual water molecules. Yeah, same when it goes to steam. Or wood. Wood's held together molecularly. There's a structure there. But as you apply heat, transfer thermal energy, 
uh, at some point, yeah, it can't handle it. It changes it molecularly. They break apart. They, they change into something else. There's a chemical reaction depending on the substance. Absolutely. So uh, this energy can go in to do different things. Only if it makes the molecules on it that translate more does the temperature increase. That's what temperature is a measure of. We're going to learn about internal energy. That would include all the, all the types of motion. Temperature just measures the average translational kinetic energy, how fast they're wiggling around. Uh, we measure, the, first, the chapter starts with thermometers. We don't have to dwell on this because you've all used thermometers, I assume. But they, they are the tool to measure temperature. The way they uh, work is, you know, here's your stereotypical thermometers. Here's a mercury one, and here's a red dyed alcohol one. Uh, this is a bulb down here, they got more of it down there. What happens is, if you put that in contact with something, like right now the air in the room, or you put it in water, then what happens? All these uh, translating molecules, they run into the, the thermometer. And what's it do to the thermometer's molecules? Yeah, it gets them moving. Well, I should, if that's hotter than that is. <laughs> Let's say that. We put this in hot water. Then the water's, yeah, moving around. Got a lot of average kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy. They run into this. Technically, what happens to the water molecules when they transfer some energy to this? Yeah, they cool off. That's why we make thermometers generally something with very little thermal mass so that it doesn't affect it much. But yeah, this would not measure accurately the uh, temperature of one drop of water if I put it on here. Because the internal energy of the water drop, some of those particles tran uh, transfer their energy to these mo molecules. This temperature increases and that temperature decreases. So, yeah, it's ineffective for little amounts. But, yeah, that's how it gets to a thermometer, and it comes into equilibrium eventually with the water. At some point, these will start moving around with the same average translational kinetic energy as the water, and we now know this is at the same temperature as the water. And we can read it. Uh, that's how these work. A uh, similar thing works here. This has a resistor inside. It's the, the current, the amount of, that flows through it changes with uh, its resistance, and resistance changes with temperature. But again, it's all because the molecules in there are either moving faster or slower, and that affects its resistance. This one is called a ga gas bulb thermometer. Nice, simple one. Uh, I just have this tube upside down. It's open, but in the water. And the water is open to the air, the atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure is pushing down on the surface pushing up and holding up this much water. So we could figure out that pressure. Uh, but I did do one additional thing in this case. To get this water to come up the tube, I preheated this bulb. I ran it under hot water. That got the air molecules inside moving faster. They had a higher temperature eventually. So they're moving around faster. Do you think that increases or decreases the pressure in there? It increases, so you know that. So then, and then I turned it upside down in there and waited. And as those came into equilibrium with the room temperature, what happened to the speed of the molecules in there? They slowed down. What do you think happened to the pressure up here? It decreased compared to out here. So atmospheric pressure then was larger and it pushed water up and it can support that much Water. So this height of water, we did that last unit, we could figure out, based on that height, gravity, and its density, I know the pressure head down here. That's the difference in pressure between here and the air right now. Did that make sense? The difference in pressure between here and the air, that's what's holding up this amount of water. And this amount of water is creating that pressure there, because they're balanced right now. If it's in an enclosed space, 
No, it increases it. Think of those, uh, I can do that. Let's do it. That'll be fun. You just have to give me 15 seconds. We'll go back to this guy. I'm going to enclose it. Turn on the heat. Let's get something about like that. So they're at a certain temperature, and they're enclosed in this box. If I increase the temperature by transferring more heat to them, you, you see the volume increased. So what if it was a fixed container and the volume could not increase? Do you see how the pressure would increase in there? Because they're now running into the walls more often. And that force over that area is pressure, force over area. We learned that. Do, do, does that make sense? So why is it that you can turn the shower on to warm the atmospheric pressure pushes the curtain in? Why when you turn your shower on warm, the atmospheric pressure pushes your curtain in? Because air, that, that fluid is moving and gets the air moving. And then Bernoulli's principle came in. When uh, a fluid's moving more quickly, what happens to the pressure? It decreases. So usually in your stall, the pressure is less than outside the stall, and that pressure difference is dominating. So, so temperature of water isn't what does that. Yeah, the temperature of, the, of your shower or water it isn't what matters. It's the, sp it's the speed. If you could fire hose and withstand it, oh, your curtain would get sucked in even more. See, I think there was a question. Let's see what you guys think. Get out your clickers. See if we're uh, making any sense here. Channel 44, pulling's open. There's twice as much molecular kinetic energy in two liters of boiling water as in one liter of boiling water. What's the same for both? Temperature or thermal energy? Let's see if you can distinguish or does it matter? They are the same, that one or the other, neither. So you got a liter and two liters. Let's see what you think. While the last ones are getting in, unless I ch ch you change your mind, let's see, there's a, now save it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and. 54% thought it was A, and a quarter of you thought it was C. Both. So either most of you think temperature and the rest think both. It is temperature. What's it say there? The average kinetic energy of the molecules is the same. How do we know that? They're both boiling. They're at the same temperature. Water boils at the same temperature. Whether, it doesn't matter how much water you have, it always boils at the same temperature. However, if you have more water, It'll take more heat applied to it to get all of them up to the same temperature boiling. Think of it this way. You got one drop of water. To raise its temperature to boiling, you apply so much heat. You have to, to get them moving faster. OK, now you got a gallon of water. If you apply the same amount of heat, thermal energy to it, transfer of energy, Will that get it up to boiling? No, that'll get a drop of it a little warmer, but you've got to get all of it up to there. So the temperature would be the same, but not their thermal energy. Who would have more thermal energy? Yeah. 
Think about that one as you answer this one. Go. Two bodies, one's hotter than the other. What does that mean? And if, as the last one's trickling, if it helps you, that if the one liter water and the two liter water, both at boiling, there's going to be a lot more thermal energy in the two liter bottle because there's more of it. They're all going that speed, but you got more of them. If that helps you with this, any, I don't know. It's a little related. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Overwhelmingly, two-thirds think it's C, kinetic energy per particle. Good job. Good job. Temperature is a measure of the average translational kinetic energy per molecule of the substance. It doesn't tell you necessarily how much internal energy is there. Temperature only tells you that translational average kinetic energy. There could be more energy there. And, and it, just like we just said, if you got more wa water at boiling than two liters versus one liter, this has more internal energy because there's more of it. Because they're all, you got twice as many going that fast. So overall, there's more internal energy. All right. Time for a uh, break it up a little. I think it's safe to say this could be my all time favorite heat related demo. What did I get? Cornstarch. There's many ways to do it. I find this the simplest. I'm going to pour some in the sheet of paper. Mm. Sure. <laughs> I'll wad it up in a moment. Let's get a flame. Time to for a new hose. <clears throat> the hose has gotten stretched out and the pressure of the gas in the line is overcoming the uh, force needed to keep it on through friction. See if it turning it around helps any. <laughs> Let's put it on the gas line, not the air line. <laughs> yep, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> there we go. Overkill. All right. So, cornstarch is not flammable. Paper is. <laughs> Roll it up, but not too tight. Take a deep breath before you put it near your mouth. Oh, you know, this is cooler in the dark. <laughs> oh, that's fun. And yeah, it makes a nice mess and smells nice and like marshmallowy or something. That doesn't have much to do with uh, what we're specifically talking about, but... <laughs> I figured it'd be fun to do it the first lecture of uh, in the middle for heat and temperature. I grew up in Kansas, 
and uh, there's uh, grain silos there. And my father was, works near one, and one of the largest or second largest in the United States exploded because of this. Uh, some things don't burn, but if you uh, can spread the surface area out for the volume, but, so when I, by blowing it, it's more like a dust, little fine particles, and so there's more surface area contact. If you expose that to heat, it can overcome some of those, that internal energy break bonds, and it can, it can uh, ignite just like that. So, you know, corn dust or wheat dust or just dust or whatever in, in a screen silo, if somebody's smoking around it or there's a spark that goes off and you, you uh, ignite it like that because you have this big dust cloud and it's enclosed in the grain silo, you just uh, increase the temperature here and created a lot of uh, internal energy there. What's it do to everything surrounding? Increases it. And now they're trapped inside the grain silo. They're pushing on the walls of it. Boom, it explodes as the pressure increases. And people heard that for uh, miles and miles around. So careful, if you think something doesn't burn, what you do with it. There's cool YouTube videos though. My favorite, uh, uh, wood dust. Fine wood dust, they put in this uh, cylinder about this big, maybe this high, and they got like a super powered uh, air compressor, and they put a road torch in it. That was fine, it doesn't ignite. But then this quick release valve, they're way back of course, <laughs> and they uh, release the air and it blows it up, hits the road flare and does that about oh, 10 stories high. <laughs> this big fireball going up vertical. There's something for you to YouTube. Mythbusters did it too. There's actually wasn't as good as this one YouTube. So <laughs> but it, uh, this can relate. This chapter talks about a sparkler. And uh, we'll get to it more when we do specific heat. But sparklers. You know, fireworks, you can get those sparks that fly on you, but it doesn't, it doesn't always burn you. And the concept here, I, I think, is a good way to remember the difference between temperature and heat. The sparks, the sparklers themselves, and probably individual little flower things, had a very high temperature. They're hot. Their average kinet translational kinetic energy is high per molecule of substance but they're, they're spread out. There's little ones. They're, for a sparkler, there aren't that many sparks or many molecules per spark. And so an individual spark does not have much thermal energy, so it can't transfer much heat to you, so it doesn't burn you. But you get a big coal on you, that's going to have more thermal energy for the same temperature, because there's more of it, and that can transfer the heat to you. Um, think, think of it this way if you're not getting it. A water drop, at a, a, bo a boiling water drop, one drop. You put that on your hand, sure, you're going to feel it. Ow! Uh, yeah. Pour the whole pot of boiling water on you, and you know that's going to hurt. It's got more internal energy, thermal energy. It can tr it's it's going to transfer more heat to you, even though they were at the same temperature. So these were very hot, but in, as a big fireball there, it didn't actually have a whole, as much internal thermal energy as you probably think. Doesn't matter, still makes an explosion. <laughs> do it again? Yeah. We'll end with it. I'll do it the last thing. Uh, uh, thermometers. Your temperature scales. Make sure you're familiar with that so the rest of the units make sense. Uh, in, the, in America, I think we're the last ones. We still use... Uh, Hi, Rich. Wait, I never get to do this. Come here. Class, will you say hello to Rich? Hello. He always does it to his class. So. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> He's another physics instructor. Great guy. Um, he teaches the physics of the human body, too. So if you want to... Uh, you're liking this stuff, but you don't want to go all into uh, the calculus-based physics. That could be fun. Where was I? Oh, in America, 
uh, Fahrenheit. We use that scale. In the Fahrenheit scale, let's see what you already know, water freezes at what temperature? 32 degrees. Water boils at? 212. 32, 212. Water, because it's so ubiquitous, that's what we use. That's usually how we built a lot of scales around. Freezing, boiling point. That's the temperatures at which they start changing phase. Celsius, the centigrade scale, the rest of the world uses. Where does water freeze in Celsius? Zero. And boil? Very good. And one you're probably less familiar with that physicists love, the standard unit, is Kelvin. And uh, water freezes at? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Some random number. Uh, you're, it's in your book, you, you, so you, when you forget. But uh, and that's uh, Kelvin. So that's the equivalent of zero to ten degree, uh, hundred degrees Celsius, or thirty-two degrees to two hundred twelve degrees Fahrenheit. Kelvin, we made a scientist because absolute zero, you might have heard of. Uh, at zero Kelvin, it's interesting too. These are degrees, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, 32 Kelvin. They don't say degree. It's an absolute scale. At zero, that's when an object has no more average translational kinetic energy. So they're not being displaced side to side at zero. And that's really cold. Do you see where freezing is? So uh, zero, absolute zero is like negative 273 degrees Celsius. Do you see that? We'd have to, on the Celsius scale, go down negative 273 kelvins to get to absolute zero. It's really cold. And thus far, nothing's ever gotten there. You know, I'm really dang close. But. And so in theory, that, what that tells me is everything's in motion. Anything with temperature above absolute zero, which is everything we've observed thus far, has some average translational kinetic energy. The hotter something is, the more it has. So let's see, what, what's room temperature in Fahrenheit-ish? 87? He likes it hot. 76? You like it warm. It depends on it. It's subjective, but around 70. In uh, Celsius, that equates to roughly 45 for room temperature. <laughs> Good point. That, that'd be really hot. 20-ish, uh, around 20 Celsius. In uh, Kelvin, Kelvin seems like this weird one. Your help is the increments of these two scales are the same. So one degree Celsius is the same increment as a Kelvin. You see there's 100 increments between freezing and boiling. Same with Celsius. So you add 20 to this, and you get to about 293 Kelvin is roughly room temperature on that scale. Just to give you an idea, and so things will make sense when you're reading these numbers in the next four chapters. And there's conversions between them all. You can see the easy conversion between these two. They're just 273 different. This is a little more funky. I'm not going to make you convert, so I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> uh, heat, I want to make sure you, you got that. I'll tell you, and then I'll do this one and do that one again, and we'll be done. This is a writer downer one. It's the energy that flows, obviously, from somewhere to somewhere else, one substance to another, because of a change in temperature. Remember the delta sign, change in, or change of. So heat will not flow if there's no difference in temperature. Two things at the same temperature, like a thermometer that came to equilibrium with the boiling water, 
It is its temperature, so heat no longer flows. They read, they read the same temperature. If there, there has to be a temperature difference for energy to flow. And I hope you see that because the molecules are uh, moving around. If they're butted up to each other, then these with more energy are going to have collisions. And these are going to speed up and these will slow down until they come into equilibrium. Heat has been transferred. And it always flows from hot to cold. So if you have a hot body and a colder body, thermal energy, heat transfer is always in that direction. From a hotter to a colder. So heat's the energy in transit. And I think we've covered uh, temperature enough. This one is a Galilean thermometer. It works off of uh, buoyancy and density. It's great. That's why I threw it out here. Because we just covered it. The lowest floating ball tells you the temperature. It's great because uh, if it gets hotter, then the air, air molecules in the room run into these and they heat them up. Energy's transferred and their average translational kinetic energy goes up and they're moving around faster. That can change how much space is in those balls because the volume, it wants to contract or expand. Things when they heat up, expand. When they cool, they contract. And if that happens, then you're changing the density of the, of the sphere, like the ketchup packet with the air bubble in it. As a unit, the density can change. If the air bubble gets smaller, what happens to the density? If the air in a cylinder gets less, it density increases and it sinks, and vice versa. So this has been calibrated. Again, it all started from the temperature of the air in the room. And so you can use it as a thermometer. Uh, water balloon full of air, what do you expect to happen? Gets me every time. Water balloon. Okay, that's enough. You get the point. You can even see it's kind of black. Where's the energy going? Water. To the water. That's what we're going to lead to next time. Specific heat. Different materials heat up at different rates. How they absorb water. Their resistance to change. Remember that. And I'll, end with, I'll do this as you pack up. Well, I guess it'll have to be that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scrape it off the floor. Lights on or off? off. Here's the heat. <gasps> there was less of it. <laughs> Have a good day.